This week's episode is brought to you by Kevil's Retail Media Cloud. Built on an API-first foundation, this platform empowers retail media networks to flexibly customize ad experiences and enhance their data control, resulting in more tailored ad experiences for users. Don't settle for black box limitations or the costs of building a loan. Kevil's Retail Media Cloud brings together the power of ad serving and CDP personalization to create on-site ads for retailers and marketplaces in a privacy-safe way. Launch a retail media network that your advertisers will love in as little as 14 days. To learn more, go to kevil.com slash listen. That's kevil.com slash listen. Welcome to the Marketecture Podcast. This is a special episode today we're calling Listeners Strike Back. We get a lot of comments on Twitter, X, elsewhere about the content we put out here on Marketecture, but also in the weekly newsletter. And sometimes people disagree with us or want to add some more context to what we said. So we have three different guests here on this special episode who are going to give us their perspective. First, we have Nandi from Check My Ads. She was a guest on our show last spring, and she tells us what she really thinks of Ad Fontas Media, who were profiled on our vendor interview just a couple of weeks ago. Then we have Adam Heimlich, who I love to box with a little bit, and he tells me why I'm wrong about Google and antitrust and why it actually harms publishers when they do their shenanigans with the auctions. And finally, friend of the pod, Micah Sullivan from Sincera comes on and gives a lot more perspective on the ID bridging issue, which was highlighted in our pod a couple of weeks ago and then in my newsletter. It's a really interesting perspective from someone who probably knows more about that subject than anybody else. We hope you enjoy this special episode, and we'll be back next week with our regular format. I'm here with Nandini Jami, who is a friend of the pod, and previously we had a great episode. Nandini, thank you for being here. Good morning, Ari. So Happy to be here. So the reason you're here is because we published an interview with Lou Pascalis from Adfontis Media couple weeks ago, Adfontis uh, does media bias ratings, and now they made that available on the trade desk. You had not the most positive reaction to that interview. I can't find the exact tweet, but I think you called them like losers, B team, bad methodology. And then I just searched on Twitter for your handle with the word Fontas next to it. And there's a video talking about your white hot rage at Ad Fontas. And then another one that says, <laughs> <laughs> the one that says, Ad Fontas Media bias chart took our fight, meaning check my ads, our fight against the global disinformation crisis and shoved it on a right versus left media bias chart, turning a non-political into a political issue in the ad industry. This damage is immense and unforgivable. Okay, you have the floor. Tell us your point of view on this. <laughs> Oh, man. I, I don't know where to start. You told me I have five to 10 minutes and I was just I was sitting there going, how am I going to fit it all in? All right. In that small amount of time. So I've I've done my best to streamline my criticism of the of the company. I mean, when I think about where to start with my criticism, I keep coming back to this tweet that the, the CEO founder of the company put out the day after Russia invaded the Ukraine. She put out her tweet on February 25th, 2022, and she called Russia Today an unusual TV outlet. And she had Russia Today on the center left of this left-right chart. And I think that encapsulates the Ad Fontes experience. I hope I don't need to explain to your viewers why Russia Today doesn't belong on a left-right chart, because it's not news. It is a propaganda outlet a state-backed, Kremlin-run propaganda outlet. And that is just the beginning. So I've called Ad Fontes Media privately and public racist at best and dangerous propaganda at worst. Now, what do I mean when I say racist at best? Well, I, I heard your interview with Lou, and the central conceit of the product is that Centrist is good. And he said himself, the closer you are to the center of their left right bias chart, the higher reliability you are. They say it in the same sentence, right? Like 
the, the more centrist you are, the more to the center of this chart that you are, the more reliable and higher quality news that you are. Now, who's in the center? And who's on the left and who's on the right? At the center, we have, the, I think, like the New York Times, probably NPR, that kind of stuff. Now, interestingly, anybody who talks about issues that are related to women, women's rights, feminism, racism, any Black-owned media is never going to make it to the center of the chart. And Do you have an example of a media company yeah. that you think is misclassified? The root, the root is on the left and closer to the bottom of the chart. The root is a Black-owned media outlet that talks about issues that are important to the Black community. Jezebel talks about issues that are important to women. They are at the forefront of the conversation about abortion. They're never going to make it to the left. So according to Ad Fontes media chart, bias chart, they're biased, therefore they're unreliable, therefore they're less worthy of your ad dollars than NPR or the New York Times. I think you could break it down to two parts. Are they more reliable or less reliable? And are they left or center? And so Ed Fontes puts those in the bottom left, which means less reliable and left wing biased. I think it's somewhat fair to say that probably NPR and the New York Times have better fact checking, more resources than you know, any sort of like independent bloggish sort of outlet. Uh, the, Jezebel doesn't get its facts wrong. The Root doesn't get its facts wrong. They all have correction policies. They're actually very good journalists who many of them who would not survive working at the New York Times. The New York Times has a lot of issues retaining and hiring people of color and people from marginalized backgrounds. So when you say that the New York Times is the bastion of, of high reliability, centrist news, what you're actually saying is centricism is, in this country, it's still biased. It's just biased towards a white, Western, mainstream population. And the kind of stories that are important to people who are from marginalized backgrounds are not going to be found in the center of Ad Fontes's chart. That's just a fact. All right, let's talk about the right side of the diagram where I think you have more cutting criticism. So uh, not to put words in your mouth, but the right includes many outlets, publications, which you don't think are news at all. Yeah, so I don't have a problem with the, the right side of the chart. I actually have a problem with the shape of the chart itself. The idea of a left-right chart is inherently inaccurate because they've thrown on their chart news outlets alongside propaganda. So as a person who walks in knowing nothing about these outlets, they can't tell the difference. This chart doesn't tell them the difference between a news outlet and, as I said, a state-backed media outlet. So what should they be doing there? Oh, I mean, I, I, I don't think their, their business model makes sense. I mean, if you listen to the, the founding story of this product, the founder started, you know, made a chart on the back of a napkin. And in order to help her friends and family understand what is reliable or unreliable because they were confused. And I think that's a great idea for your friends and family. But now that they have turned it into a business, it deserves a lot more scrutiny, especially as they come into working with the trade desk and putting this really, you know, putting this product out in a way that really determines how media dollars are invested. So if we're going to talk about how this chart works, I want to look at their methodology. So they have their methodology written out on their website, and I've read it, and I've concluded that it is mostly bullshit and vibes. So, they, so their methodology is the following. They have three analysts for each outlet that they rate. They have, all the, they, they have a left person, they have a center person, and they have a, a right person, right wing, or I don't know, conservative, I don't know. They have them read. So they, first of all, they have them self-identify as leftist or centrist or, or right wing. Already, I think that's, a, that's an interesting, um, <laughs> and by interesting, I mean wildly inaccurate and unreliable way of even coming to the market. Because what is a centrist? What is a leftist? I mean, I, I consider myself a centrist, but Dan Bongino considers me a leftist. So what exactly are we talking about here? Or what if I'm really so-called leftist on one issue, but centrist or right on another issue? Then what am I? So I, I realize they have like a, 
they have like numbers and stuff. And like, if you're, you know, you know, five out of 10, you, you're you centrist, whatever. But left, center and right inherently are meaningless. And they're constantly changing with the tides of the political environment. Yeah, I brought right? this what up. Was- I brought this up in my interview with uh, Lou, the, the Overton window problem, which is, uh, you know, three months ago, no one was talking about stopping uh, in vitro fertilization. And now it's a top topic in, in the political discourse. Oh, I love that you're bringing that up. I love that you're bringing that up. We'll talk about that in a second. So they have these they have these analysts. Well, first of all, the, the analysts themselves have they have to have an undergraduate degree. They have to, you know, at least a passing interest in the news. They're regular readers of the news. Um, but other than that, they're not really experts in their in the field, right? They're they're like interested civilians. So they have them read the top news articles. So like the most prominent, you know, top read articles, and then they have them rate them based on Mostly things like language and rhetoric. So you're looking at the article going, hmm, are they biased here? Did they use multiple points of view? Did they, like, how is the language? What does the headline look like? And then they jump on a Zoom call after, you know, rating their, these articles and what they think the outlet should be, you know, overall rate, rated as. You have them jump on a Zoom call and they basically have them haggle. So you'll have the centrist guy being like, well, I thought it was a five here because blah, blah, blah. And then the, the leftist is going to be like, oh, I think it's a whatever. So and then they have to like come to a consensus like they're on a jury. Right. Right. It's like the <laughs> McLaughlin group for for ad tech. OK, so you can see how that methodology works in action on Ad Fontis's methodology page. They have what they consider to be a good example of this working as it should, according to their own their own standards. So I watched the methodology video and I have, <laughs> and it is, it is of these three people rating the Heritage Foundation. Right. Why don't you tell our listeners what the Heritage Foundation is if they don't know? So I will in a second. I actually have my, I've, I've notes here of all the things I want to say about the Heritage Foundation. <laughs> all right, so, I'll fill it in. Heritage Foundation is a very far, far No, no, right. no, don't fill it in. <laughs> You know, this might be the only no, episode of this podcast that my wife is actually going to be interested in listening to. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't. No, no, I don't want to talk about the Heritage Foundation as far right, because that is not getting to the heart of what the Heritage Foundation actually is and the way that we need to talk about it and, and understand it. The Heritage Foundation is what, what these analysts don't know, because what these analysts did on this you know, in their Zoom call is talk about, oh, the language of this headline, you know, it seems pretty all right to me. You have the guy, you know, the centrist guy go, oh, yeah, you know, okay, fine, I'll give it a couple more points in this direction, because, you know, all the Republicans believe this now. So they're all sitting here haggling about words on a page. They don't know that the Heritage Foundation is the organization funded, by the way, by dark money donors that is behind the federal and state rollback of abortion rights in this country. They don't know that the Heritage Foundation is behind the book burnings that we're reading about in the news, the the banning of books in public libraries. The Heritage Foundation is behind the critical race theory, that whole thing. For for months, they're talking about how they're teaching children, four-year-olds, critical race theory. That's all BS. And that comes from the Heritage Foundation. It is one of their initiatives. And you know what they do? They create the story themselves, and then they write about it on the Heritage Foundation and its sister, you know, newspaper, the the Daily Signal. They're about as none far, of that factors. They're about as unreliable and far right as you could get with outside of, you know, Russia today. Again, I want to I want to talk to you about the stakes here because you keep saying far right. The Heritage Foundation is behind Project Twenty Twenty Five which is a organized initiative, including dozens of nonprofit organizations. It's a coalition of people and organizations that seek to dismantle the government and the constitution as we know it today. They seek to dismantle the FBI. They seek to slash the budget of the DOJ. They want to entirely eliminate the Department of Education. They want to make abortion fully illegal. They want to create a department of life in this country. So we can talk about far right, far left. We can label it how we want. But what brands need to know and what people need to know, because I know Ad Fontes is also trying to sell into schools and universities 
They're trying to sell this right. Well, I don't know what the hell these words mean, but I know what it means to dismantle the Department of Education. And they don't factor any of that into their analysis. And so what you're getting is bullshit. All right. That is a excellent place to stop. Uh, Nandini, thank you so much for being here. I love to hear the honest, fresh, impassioned take on this issue that obviously means a lot to you. I'm going to stay relatively neutral in this whole thing, um, but I really appreciate you taking the time to be here. Thanks so much, Ari. I hope your wife enjoys. All right. We have Adam Heimlich, the CEO of Chalice. So Adam was on the show months ago, one of our most popular episodes, probably because him and I bickered a bit. And we have him back to tell me why I'm wrong. Adam, thanks for being here. Yeah. Tell me, should I pretend we're not friends? Feel free. Um, it's good for ratings. Yeah, it's good for ratings. Exactly. It's like WWE over here. Um, <laughs> so right. the nature of this disagreement, if I could summarize, you can characterize it otherwise, is that in relation to Google's antitrust trial and to the, and we're talking about the ad tech one, not the search one, there's all this evidence that they had all these shenanigans around the auctions in ad X and how it relates to GAM and how it relates to DB360 and all this stuff. And my point that I made, uh, I made a couple times, is that it's very difficult to prove that it harmed their customers, the publishers, in any way. In fact, it mostly harmed competitors like the Magnites of the world and the trade desks of the world. But the actual customers, I think, in my opinion, in many cases, made more money than they would have otherwise. So that's point. Adam, you have the floor. <laughs> Yeah. So otherwise, an antitrust is is but for Google. It means if Google didn't exist or if they didn't do all the conducts that they did, would they have made more money? And Google's tests that they made more money were internal A-B tests, like with or without the thing in question. So it'll be a much narrower question. But more importantly, like the, the, the message that's coming through um, from Google's lawyers and from unaffiliated lawyers at law schools and different antitrust experts is, oh, it's very hard to prove, and there's a very narrow window for an antitrust case, and you know, it's very bold to bring this. And I'm calling bullshit on that. Like, that's bullshit. Like, Jonathan Cantor is someone who is like me, who sees all these people saying, oh, this is very complicated, no way people could understand this. And he's saying, you know what, I could cut right through that with some pretty simple stories. And that's what he's going to do. Like, they chose to have a jury trial, which means the government is saying they themselves were harmed. It's something you only do if you think you could spark some righteous outrage in a jury. And that's what they're going to do. They're going to go in there and say, hey, publishers only wanted one thing. They wanted a unified auction that got them the highest CPM for every ad opportunity. That's very simple. And Google never let them do it. They claimed they were going to let them do it and then didn't. And there was no choice but to work with Google because of the way that they tied their stack together. So publisher just trying to put out a news site or a blog. They're going to have publisher witnesses talking about how this is all they wanted. Highest CPM from every ad opportunity. Google thwarted them, lied about it, and it went on for years. So you're making the argument that it will be provable in court, which is a slightly different argument from what I thought we were having. Because my question is, did it actually harm publishers? They didn't get what they wanted, but they made more money. That's my argument. And I'll give you an example. One of the earliest things that Google did in this whole process of manipulating the auctions was variable rev shares, where effectively, when the demand was coming from Google Ads, formerly known as AdWords, and it was bidding on AdX, and it was not going to win because the bid reduction would take their bid below a higher bid from somebody else, Google would just take a lesser rev share. They would basically give some money back to the auction and win. This is obviously anti-competitive and obviously made Google Ads win more. But did it actually cost the publishers any money? It seems like the publishers may have even made slightly more money because the demand from that third-party source would come back later. Yeah, so what you, you just exemplified, what Google has to do in this trial is talk about why the particular conducts don't meet the definition of anti-competitive behavior. I think, yeah, some of those may be true. If you isolate the conduct and zoom in and talk about all publishers on average, uh, you might be able to prove that empirically. And that might carry the day at trial, frankly. The jurors might be of that mind. But the truth is 
for every case they could show where the publisher made more money, some other publisher made less money or that that conduct was paired with a conduct that went the other way. Like Google was controlling this whole market, picking winners and losers through tactics like these. And you could show everybody knows that crappy publishers make a lot of money from advertising and good publishers have a much harder time making money from advertising. So that doesn't have to be proven empirically. The jury's going to know that from their own experience of seeing clickbait sites proliferating across the internet for the last 10 years. Right. So the one instance where I think I would have to agree with you that some publishers won and some publishers lost uh, was what was called Global Bernanke. And a quick primer on this. In Bernanke, what Google did was they kept a little bank account for every publisher and they would use the second price auction to bank away a little bit of money and then use that money to win auctions they wouldn't have otherwise won. And the publishers ended up even and Google ended up ahead because their demand won more and the competitors lost. Okay, fine. That follows my earlier argument. Publishers didn't lose. But then Global Bernanke was where the bank account was spread across publishers and they did pick winners and losers. And in, in fact, the, the, so the losers were picked because they were the ones who were giving benefits to other parties, particularly Critio. So if you were a publisher who was using Critio as a first look vendor, they made Global Bernanke intentionally take money away from you in the auction. That's pretty bad. It's bad for Critio. But uh, all right, why is it called Bernanke? Because it's a bank. Central no, bank. no, why? because it bought inflation. It made CPMs lower on the whole. That's oh, why it's called OK. That. OK. Is, is that true or are you just making that up? No, that's true. That's in the case. <laughs> It was the equivalent. It's the the paper, the internal Google paper is called Project Bernanke and quantitative easing for the ad market. Right. So so quantitative easing is what Bernanke used to fight inflation. uh, And that's what it was supposed to do, fight CPM inflation. Wait, wait, no, no. no. Quantitative easing is not for, uh, quantitative tightening is for fighting inflation. Quantitative easing is for growing the economy. Uh, What did they actually do in quantitative easing? Quantitative easing is when you lower rates to spur the economy. They were trying to lower CPMs to spur the ad economy, All especially right. their buy side ad economy. Okay, so what do you think about the European lawsuit? So Axel Springer and a bunch of other publishers in but Europe. But it did lower all- CPMs on the whole. Sorry, just before we close <laughs> it out, it did lower CPMs on the whole, right? Like that, that's what the jury's going to hear the government say is like, on the whole, this lowered CPMs, which means your local paper made less money than they should have. And that's a harm. I don't know that that's proven, though. I mean, you you disparage A/B testing at the beginning of this, but like they really did run A/B tests, and they showed they showed in their A/B tests. I've seen documents where they say publishers made more money, advertisers made more money, everyone made more money except for Critia. So that means the buy side paid more. So you're saying my exp- experience as a buyer should have been increasing CPMs because Google was so effective. But yeah, I'm telling you, my so experience you as a buyer, using- everyone was was lower CPMs. If you were not using a Google product. Like if you were a Critio advertiser, you were paying more. That's really the harm there. I still think the publishers made made out fine. Oh, right. So Google themselves made their prices lower for themselves. So that when for they themselves, talk, exactly. That's, that's what they, what they were did. easing. They were easing their own competitive pressure. Right. So if you were an advertiser using Google Ads or DB360, you got a benefit from all this stuff uh, because you won more at lower prices. It was only if you were using an external demand source like the, like the Trade Desk or Critio that you suffered. So that's what, that's why there's two comparisons, right? So Google would say, all right, publishers will give you a little more money. And they do make more than they did before. But the antitrust question is, what if Google didn't exist and it was real competition for monetization on publishers? And I think even you would have to agree, like they would have gotten everybody's CPM up, not just Critio's. I agree CPMs would have increased in some ways, but I, I'm not sure it's even predictable given how all the markets interact. You know, right. because that brings up header bidding, though. But header bidding, as soon as you as soon as you went around Google, everyone made more money. That was that's my true. Methods. Yeah, so that header bidding universally made publishers more money, and so the reason for that is because without header bidding, there was an inefficiency in the auction because some demand was not able to reach the publisher because it was sniped by Google, basically. So, um, one last thing before we go. So, what do you think about the European lawsuit that was announced a couple weeks ago with Axel Springer and some other publishers, all of whom are deeply embedded with Google? They all use GAN, they all use Adex, and now they're suing Google for a couple billion dollars, effectively a private action under the same antitrust considerations. Yeah, it looks early, but I guess they're expecting it to take a very long time to play out. 
But I think, you know, we'll see a lot of these, and especially if Google loses or even seems to do poorly, we'll see a lot of people looking to get paid in civil suits. Yeah, if I was a Google lawyer, I wouldn't look forward to having a bunch of German jurors. I don't know how the, how the <laughs> civil system yeah, works yeah. in Germany, but I can't yeah. be an advantageous bunch of when jurors. When people look there. back at, at U.S. versus Microsoft, when people look back at U.S. for no one says like Microsoft was just competing and they're actually, what people say about that case is Microsoft was trying to smother the internet in its crib. Right? That's not what that trial was about, but you could see that now. And I think over time, U.S. First Google will be clearly about Google trying to smother the AI revolution, to keep anyone else from getting data, building their own models. They're tr just trying to kill this thing before it gets out of control and be the only one that has enough data to do predictive modeling and algorithms and ad tech. It's not clear now, but that's what it was really about, keeping publishers from getting the data they need to monetize their sites. All right, Adam, thank you so much for giving us your perspective. I'm sorry I was yeah. wrong. I think you're a great analyst. I respect your opinion. I wonder if from working there, you have, you know, it's it's harder for you to feel righteous anger over the conduct than- uh, So I'm not just wrong, I'm biased also, is what you're saying. I appreciate that. <laughs> I wonder, I wonder if it's biased because I, you know, I think it's unlikely that you're wrong. But of course, when something is in front of a jury, you know, who knows, you know, and no one can predict what's going to happen, right? I think I'd be disqualified if I was in the jury pool. I think a couple <laughs> questions in, they'd be like, no, this guy, too much. All right. <laughs> Thanks again. This was awesome. Yeah, thank you. Have a good one. All right. I'm here with Michael Sullivan, friend of the pod from Sincera. And this week, I published some thoughts on ad bridging, which was a topic that was queued up by a great ad week article and involved SSPs using IDs in ways DSPs were not expecting. And Mike reached out to me and had a number of points that he wanted to clarify or enhance versus what I had said in my newsletter. So let's jump in. So I think the first general complaint or thought you had was that I made a remark in my newsletter that this sort of thing where the IDs are wrong or artificial was relatively easy to detect. And you think it's a little harder than that. So why don't you talk me through how long you've been seeing this as you've been in the industry forever and what do you think about that statement? Yeah, sure. I'm, I may take issue with forever, but uh, enough to have seen this before. And I first saw this behavior, ID bridging, about five years ago, and it was occurring very infrequently. So I, I don't want to imply that this has been like super popular under the radar for, for that many years. But it was the behavior itself was very interesting because it was a server side connection and it was a Safari device. And we were seeing cookie based IDs that were well over a year old. And like, not that we saw them a year ago, but they were active and, and they had a long history on them. And it was just like, how is this possible? And to your point, like, you know, is it easy to detect? I think conceptually as humans, like, yes, you can just say, hey, this is a Chrome ID on a cookie user. But in practice, it's challenging for a few reasons. Like one, you know, these IDs are not you know, easily queryable. They're usually in these high speed databases that are right on the edge that like, it's not just like a SQL query that people can run, right? And if you're not looking for this, the DSPs and SSPs are like, are very fast, but often very naive. They're at like internet scale, but they're just going to see this ID in action. They're not going to think like a human. So you know, they're not regularly queryable. They don't have sort of this like intuition, logic-based approach that they're going to come up with on their own. So if you don't have or you haven't seen it or someone didn't tell you to look into this, it's highly unlikely that you would actually have seen it and, and sort of actioned it. That's sort of like the first point about, I would say, why it's not maybe as easy as it may seem. The second point is... OK, like even if you know about it now, you can action now, you can talk to your engineering team, get the query in. Great. But what happens on January 1st when you don't have these two cohorts, Safari traffic and Chrome traffic? It's all cookie-less now. You get a request with a load of me panorama ID or you get a request with a UID2 or, you know, a ramp ID from ATS. How do you know that that came and that wasn't bridged in? Uh, and, you know, if there's no declaration of anything like that. So it's actually going to get significantly harder to detect it in this sort of methodology that is is sort of straightforward now. It's like, yeah, it's great that it's straightforward for what, eight months? And then what? Yeah, that's, I hadn't thought about that. So when it, after January, cookies are gone, presumably January 1st, 2025, you'll just have some portion of your traffic that have IDs and you'll sort of have no idea where they came from or whether they're kosher. 
Really interesting. Uh, the other sort of point you had made was that some DSPs are aware and okay with this. They have ad bridging relationships themselves. And so we shouldn't paint this with such a broad stroke that it's entirely fraud, which was not my intention. Not my intention to paint it that way. I think anytime someone says like this is fraud, it can it can you know it gets people tuned up, which understandably uh, you know people would be would be aware and want to make sure they're not losing money. By the way, this is the second time you've referred to this as uh, ad bridging versus ID bridging. Sorry, um, I sorry. don't know if you're totally trying to rebrand it. Uh, no, uh, no, no, no. Yeah, so. There are use cases like, you know, this was this was occurring in the industry and there were partnerships where whereby the DSP and the SSP were both aware they have contracts, they have things in writing or the publisher has contracts in writing with a provider. So it's not all like lumped into this one behavior of silently occurring. No one knows about it, you know, swapping out safari sort of un, like freshly created no history on it id with a chrome id with a lot of history so it's not just that people weren't weren't sort of in the picture there were lots of cases where the dsps were were aware and i think actually uh, you know credit to the ssps for like when this article came around like you know they're not sort of pointing the finger because i think a lot of those dsps are are not speaking up and 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 that's fine that's their right but there were and there continue to be a lot of cases where this is a, a, a contractual agreement between parties that they are comfortable with some form of this. I just yeah. want to clarify, is it ever OK to or does any DSP ever want their buyer ID field to be replaced with a non buyer ID field? So I personally have seen and have had a request for a field to be moved around uh, or like something to be put into the buyer UID. Now, it was very innocuous where it was like, hey, if it's null and it's in Safari, like, can you please put the UID one value in there in, in the right. buyer UID field? So like that, that's fairly benign. Um, but there are cases, you know, that that folks, you know, want something in there. And it's it's less, honestly, it's less about oh, I can't wait to like, you know, juice up the stats and, and do this. Let's just kind of like have this work around. It's more common that it's like, dang, there's a lot of IDs in this ext, user.ext object. I don't have time in the roadmap to store all these associations and store all these additional bits um, for all these IDs. I just want this one. So, hey, if there is a, you know, I have a contract and I'm allowed to use UID2, and it's Safari, and you have nothing. Can you just put the UID to um, you know asset yeah. in there? Yeah, and if you're if you're running a DSP, um, it's very expensive to look up IDs. But then if you're also doing it n number of times effectively by saying this ID could be this ID, it could be this ID, then we need to look up the segments and the frequency gap for n IDs on a given impression. It's extremely expensive and hard to even model how expensive it is. At Critio, it was constantly this sort of question of, can this piece of tech that housed all the graph, like, can we take in another ID? Because you're horizontally scaling it out. Like, what is this going to do to performance in, in terms of, uh, you know, given auction? So it's not necessarily like it's easy to sort of see the headline and be like, oh, my gosh, this is nefarious. When in, in some ways, it's just like there is a, a pragmatic element to it. And again, I'm not saying and I, I personally agree that swapping out silently without declaration of the of a Chrome ID into a Safari solution, that's wrong. That shouldn't happen. I think all of these cases should be declared. And again, in a cookie world, we should have a permanent object here that declares when something like this has happened. But the need for this type of and the value created is not, you know, there are parties who have explicitly requested it for a variety of reasons. So the, then you brought up another question in your text to me, which I had thought about. And I was thinking about putting this in my newsletter, but decided not to, which was, shouldn't the buyer ID field just disappear on January 1st, 2025? Uh, because effectively, the definition of the buyer ID field is a synced cookie or a permanent ID, like an IDFA. I guess you could still have some IDFAs and Android IDs post-2025, but the sync cookie effectively goes away with Chrome. Am I missing something? It should. Uh, I, I somewhat cheekily brought up this point at a Tech Lab conversation, and I was met with some some strong pushback. But to be fair, if I was transacting 
on this protocol and I think you were at beeswax, you know, back in the day, I don't think either of us would be like, okay, yeah, deprecate it. Just put it in at, you know, zero, zero, (laughs) zero, one on Jan one. Yep. We're just going to ignore this field. So that's another example of conceptually it. We agree. And like this, that should be the case. Pragmatically, it is, it is unlikely to be the case. I think, and this is again, like just my, my, this view and like a dollar fifty will still not get you a cup of coffee at Starbucks. But I think this field should evolve or replace it and call it something else or change the definition to something like buyer's primary or buyer specified primary ID or something along those lines, or get rid of it and just keep an array and let someone pluck something out of it. But I, I suspect it will stick around for quite a while because it will serve in the future as some sort of like primary, primary ID. Um, I don't see it being complicated. Yeah. Like as usual with these things, the alternative IDs are an object that's very flexible, that could have many, many rows and that is great, but it also kind of makes the DSP do a lot of work to understand and interpret it when they may just want a single ID. Exactly. Like maybe they don't use the name buyer UID, they retire that and they put another object there in the same spot. But I, I think, I think we've gotten a little comfortable and this is like super inside baseball, but I think we've gotten a little comfortable with these like EXT objects in the bid request that are so free form that they're just really unpredictable. And it's just too costly to be doing this like regex parsing in real time, like for all of these. Like, I think that's honestly, personally, I think that's a reason why seller defined audiences haven't been adopted as as widely um, as they could be, because it's, again, operating in, in this sort of more freeform part of the bid right. request. Yeah, maybe we need some some notion of, um, you know, most reliable ID or preferred ID on buy or sell side. The last thing I'd, I'd just get your feedback on is this little idea that deterministic should mean deterministic or shouldn't it? And I, I think this this is a hot topic for me because I think the buyer, meaning the advertiser or their agency, is going to come to the table with the belief that deterministic is rock solid, like 100% certainty of who the user is. And if there are other definitions of deterministic in the middle of the chain, it's going to give another black eye to ad tech and is going to really disappoint the people who have the money. What's your thinking on this? Off the top, I would agree, but I would ask you just to clarify, like, can you give me a scenario where like there's a swap where it's it's not as deterministic just just to ground the, the conversation? Yeah, sure. So ID bridging where you know a user's email, has the email address on one device and then the ad is coming from a different device with the same IP address. So you insert the UID2 into that second request. Right. Well, I actually think that that is a lot less likely than you might think. Because specifically, like the agreements, the contractual agreements for UID2 and Ramp ID prohibit you from joining against a user agent or an IP address in that manner. So if someone is doing that, like I think they're taking a very big risk with access to the ID. Um, now, I think there are some cases where it's not IP based. Like what happens if, you know, there's a user has multiple email addresses, you're getting an email like a uh, subscription, you click a link and you're signed in with a different email there. Like, I think that is, there are some like more edge cases where that is a, that's a bridge, but it's hashed email to hashed email. As far as I know, I think there's really only two deterministic, like purely deterministic IDs right now. And that's ramp ID and UID2. And they are very, very contractually specific about not letting you do that kind of behavior. So if an advertiser sees that, I think they're right to feel ripped off. And I think it's not likely that that company will continue doing it much longer. All right. That's a good perspective. Well, Michael, thank you so much for being here. I appreciate you giving our audience additional color. Uh, You didn't exactly call me wrong like the other guests on this uh, pod did, Uh, but (laughs) but you gave some really helpful feedback on this issue of ID bridging. Yeah, my pleasure. Um, I'm excited to see future episodes of like Ari's iMessage inbox and, you know, all the tips and, and, and uh, whispers that, that arrive in there. You wouldn't believe it. If I'm ever subpoenaed, it's going to be trouble for some people in this industry. Thanks, Ari. Yep. Thanks again. Well, that does it for this episode. We heard some really interesting perspectives from our listeners. And if you have comments or thoughts, just add us on the various channels, either Markitecture or me personally at Ari Papp. 
And we want to hear from you and we want to hear your perspectives. Thank you. Thank you for subscribing to Marketecture. New interviews are added every week at marketecture.tv and your favorite podcasting app.